One of the great tragedies in life is when people are made to suffer on account of their best qualities. Furthermore, if you really want to make someone suffer, make them feel guilty about their best traits, specifically the traits that we can clearly see as being godly traits, the ones that are organized, the ones that are, are upstanding, the ones that are seeking to give life and make the world a place where people can come to God. The devil, the diabolical one, and all of his demons, they take pleasure when people suffer on account of their best traits. However, God, he hears the suffering of his people, and God does not sit by and watch his people suffer for the things which are clearly righteous and say, this is okay. When God looks to his own kingdom, he does not set aside residencies for people to be persecuted for all eternity on account of their righteousness. Instead, God comes to his people with hopes and aspirations that they will be taken to a better place, that they could be rewarded for their righteous endurance. Welcome to Kingdom of the Logos, a Christian program of critical thinking and adventure. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor, and we are a program put together by clergy in the Church of the Nazarene. I'm not alone here in Curd Cord Purgatory. There is one other with us. Pastor Anthony Allegria. And we say in curd over here like we're eating cheese curds, which are actually pretty good. We're getting into like the holiday season. We just kind of came out of Thanksgiving, so there's always the different food things, and I guess those are still on the mind. Well, today we're going to begin our series of Advent messages. We're going to take a step aside from our study deep into the Gospel according to St. Matthew, and today we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be looking in our scriptures at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And they're a righteous couple who lived blamelessly before the Lord. But in spite of their righteousness, they had no children, and therefore they endured shame amongst their neighbors. Zechariah and Elizabeth they didn't have any children to pass their priestly lineage and wisdom onto, and therefore they were held in ill repute by their neighbors. That's just the fact of how the world worked back then, and it's not so different than how people are today. We may not persecute people for not having children, but there's a lot of irrational things which happen in the world where people do suffer on account of their best qualities. But the kingdom of God doesn't leave people there. We do find that there are times where people there are looking for joy in life and they're, they're really righteous in one area of life. They're trying to do things for their family and yet their family turns back and spites against them. Usually this sort of persecution like faced by Zachariah and Elizabeth, it is personal. It's not some macro state level persecution or some giant far away people coming to create some structure that keeps you down. But it's the people you know. It's the people that live across the street from you. It's the people who you invite over for dinner. It's the people who you live life with. And there are times where those close to us, we endure sufferings for our best qualities, and that is always a terrible, terrible thing. This is what really breaks a soul. Many have endured life with the sufferings that are similar to Zachariah and Elizabeth. Again, you've got to take a moment to recognize who this couple is. They've reached their, their years in life where they're no longer young, and they've been faithful to one another. They've been upstanding specifically as a married couple. And yet they're despised for their lack of children. Family for Zachariah and Elizabeth was the very thing that they were faithful to. It was the very thing that they were righteous and blameless in. And yet it was also the thing that was unfulfilling for them. It was the source of their agony. In all of this, you look at it and find that this area of life where they're so blameless, yet is also the place where they find shame, it's almost as if it is a diabolical scheme. But when God looks to this, he comes to them bringing a small and profound miracle. God needed a messenger for his son. And the simple miracle of a child born to Elizabeth and Zechariah, it would do. It would be profound enough to set the paths straight for the coming of God's own begotten son. And that is our Lord, Christ Jesus. Today, as we come to the gospel according to Luke, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 7, and then we're going to skip a little bit further down of chapter 1. But for now, if you want to begin with me in chapter 1, let's go to verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abia. And his wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all of the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. We see this story, and again, we find so many details in just a few moments. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they're not the first couple to be without children. They're not the first people to suffer this affliction. We find throughout the history of the people of God, 
those like Abraham and Sarah, who God came to them and said, go, get up, go on this adventure of family, go on the adventure that I'm calling you to. I'm taking you somewhere. I don't want to leave you there. We find others throughout the history of the people of God who have no children, but yet they leave behind a legacy. We find many people throughout the history of the people of God who God looks at and says, I'm going to work a miracle in your life. For some, that miracle, it happens in their immediate moments where they see a transformation happen right before their very eyes. For others, it takes years, even decades, before they see the fruits of what God is doing through them. For some, they may never even see it in their own lifetime. The fruits and blessings of their work for the kingdom of God, it only manifests hundreds of years down the road, if not thousands. Whenever God comes to his people, though, there is a common theme. God hears the suffering of his people, and he is going to make good on it. So let's go back now to our chapter in the Gospel of Luke and begin in 1 verse 8. Once, when he was serving as a priest before God, and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. And then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before them to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. In verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man. My wife is getting on in years. And in verse 19, the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled according to their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until these things occur. In verse 21, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. And when he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. And when his time of service had ended, he went to his home. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me. When he looked favorably upon me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. We find in this God coming to people ready to work a miracle in their life. And God wants to work in all of our lives. For some of us, we may be in that darkest valley and find the exit here in this life. But whether we find it now in the immediate future or it is one that is down the road, we can have assurance that there is always hope in the kingdom of God. Elizabeth and Zechariah, they faced shame on account of a righteous aspect of their life. And again, it was from those right around them. It was among their own people. It was people across the street, people who would be waiting outside for Zechariah to come out. And those, the same people who might persecute them, they were the same people who were able to recognize that God was doing something there. Now, it's fascinating we find this message from the angel Gabriel that there are going to be people who turn their hearts back to the Lord. For a priest, this is wonderful news. If you can just imagine being someone who is charged with being a steward of God's kingdom and find out that you're going to have a son, a miraculous son who is going to turn people's hearts back towards their God, this is a wonderful thing. And in this miracle, there's really two tiers that we can clearly see going on here. In the local aspect of Zachariah and Elizabeth, this small family unit, which is about to increase by one, there's a blessed thing happening there. But yet, on the larger scale, moving outside just their local family, we find that there are people who may have never known Zachariah Elizabeth. They may never even hear those names, but they're going to encounter John the Baptist, and they're going to turn their hearts. 
And they're going to know that the Messiah is coming. And for some of them, they'll not only see John, but they will actually live to see Christ Jesus walk this earth and get to experience his ministry with their own eyes. Truly, this child is a simple miracle, sort of like the sun sitting in the sky. It is a simple thing. But yet the ramifications of it are profound. It is a powerful miracle. Just because it is simple does not mean that it is mild or that it is without meaning. It, in fact, has great meaning. What we see happening here is, again, God coming to give hope to people who cannot find it on this earth. Let's pick up now in verse 57 of our text. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, No, he is to be called John. And in verse 61, they said to her, None of your relatives have this name. And in verse 62, they began motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him. And then he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And all of them were amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue freed. And he began to speak, praising God. And fear came over all the neighbors. And all of these things were talked about through entire hill country of Judea. All who heard them pondered and said, What then will this child become? For indeed the hand of the Lord was with him. We come to our scripture today and we're reminded that God values the family greatly. And he also values children very greatly. The first institution ordained by God was marriage. And it was the entire adventure of life. Something this this whole idea that marriage it would be the the facility where the adventure of life, this adventure of holiness, it would be carried out through the family setting. The family structure was the ordained means by which children would be born. And generations would be carried on through the family setting. In fact, the great task of being kings and queens with dominion over the earth would be carried out through the family setting. God created a creature, humankind, and he created it with man and woman. He created both in his image with a specific design for the masculine and the feminine. Both were equally important before the eyes of God and both were equally necessary to the longevity of humanity. And that's fundamentally true. That's how people are reproduced. It requires man and woman. But God, he looks at his creatures and he knew that this was something which was so important. And throughout the history of God sitting in the throne of heaven, looking down on his creatures, he has been moved whenever his his beings, they, they have agony. I think one of the most profound statements we find in the Old Testament is the last verse in the second chapter of Exodus. When the people of God are groaning in slavery, their children were stolen from them, their families ripped apart, and the young were cast into the Nile, and their deaths were done by the will of a tyrannical Pharaoh. But the second chapter does not end with evil and unheard sorrow. For Exodus chapter 2 ends with this verse. Verse 25 of Exodus 2 says, God looked upon the Israelites and God knew. Whenever God sees that his creatures are filled with sorrows and he hears their groaning, God knows. And sometimes people are blessed with children of their own blood. Some go through this life without children of their own. And even others take children on as if they are their own, even though they are not. We find those like Mordecai who raised his orphaned cousin Esther as his own daughter. Throughout time, God has always cherished the great responsibility of family life. It is a precious and difficult adventure. And God is not a dormant God, and he knows when his creatures long for family. Some of them will find it on this earth, and others they find their hope in being adopted into God's family, where they will find eternal joy. It is a truly terrible thing whenever we find people on this earth being made to suffer for their best qualities. When they are taken advantage of and manipulated because of the righteous desires of their heart. In fact, when we look around the world, some of the most diabolical things that happen are people preying on good trends. This is one of the things which has really corrupted our modern culture is they know that there are people who have a few lingering Christian instincts, even though they may not be avid church attenders, And they look at them and they say, well, we can pray on that. We can write God bless on something and and by invoking the name of God, we'll, we'll tap into that underlying charity. And if they don't do whatever we're attaching the name of God to, well, then they'll feel guilty. 
Or we can set something up and say it's virtuous to do this and people will feel guilty if they're not doing the virtuous thing. Evil people have long understood the power of manipulating people's righteous inclinations. And it's a diabolical scheme capable of breaking down the souls of good people, taking away their meaning and making them feel worthless. It's no coincidence that the blameless couple of Zachariah and Elizabeth Elizabeth, suffer in the way that they do. Evil often has a conscious motive, taking pleasure in twisting people and crushing their souls. Scripture has long warned us about this truth of fallen creation. A world tainted by sin loves to break down the righteous. And what better way to do that than to crush them where they are strongest? Zachariah and Elizabeth, they suffered for their lack of children. They were ashamed by their neighbors, and without children they had no one to bless with by the fruits of their life. But God held this couple to be blameless. And on account of that, God looked at them and knew. God would bless them with a gift, and it would be a very profound gift indeed. The kingdom of God, it is a place of hope. For some, the hope of a family is easily found, but for others it is more distant. The hope of Zechariah and Elizabeth was found in the simple blessing of a child. The hope for them was to have someone to whom they could pass on their life. Yet the simple miracle was very profound for the world around them. It was profound for them as a couple, but it was also profound for the world. God needed a prophet, a messenger, to make the path straight for Christ Jesus. And God chose to bring about such an important messenger through the means of family. God did not need a palace or ivory tower to create and train John. He just needed an upright and blameless couple. Whenever people look in the world around us, they say, well, well, wh- what is the problem of, of suffering? Why are these things there? And they, they look to worldly institutions and they say, oh, there's this sin going over and over there. It's because people aren't educated. They say, oh, well, that's going over there. If we can just educate people, it'll go away. No. The antidote to all sin is always the blood of Christ Jesus. Jesus did not come and die on a cross that people would have a, a free pass into an institution of higher learning or they'd get to go into a school or they'd get some special training. That's not why Christ Jesus came. Education is not the antidote to suffering. Furthermore, social programs are not the antidote to suffering. The antidote to suffering always is the gospel and the blood of Christ Jesus. When God needs someone to come and set the path straight for this, God doesn't need a palace. He doesn't need some, some royal lineage that will have treasures and things to bestow on a child. He doesn't need to be one born into the, the city with the largest library and an ivory tower to create and train John. He doesn't need some sort of mad science lab where they can crossbreed people to get someone who has the, the highest IQ and to have the best genes or anything like that. The only thing God needs to bring about a messenger for God's own son is an upright and blameless couple. That is all God needs. And God answers the prayers of Zechariah and Elizabeth. God saw their suffering and he would give them the great responsibility of raising up a child. And this child would also be a prophet. This family, they were enough for God. And it was enough for him to prepare a prophet to make the way for Christ. It was enough. It was enough to send the world a message of hope. The kingdom of God is always a kingdom of hope. And that hope may be experienced differently by each of us based on our different circumstances, but it always has the same source and the same destination. God's kingdom is a place of life and meaning, and it comes from being fulfilled by the blood of Christ Jesus who comes to save us. Not to take and put us into a utopia here on this world, but to save us that we can be adopted into the children of God and be brought to a, a place where the family of God it has fulfillment, it has meaning for eternity. For those who are righteous and they have experienced persecution for the sake of their righteousness, God hears them. Now, evil is an interesting thing, so evil will persecute other things of evil. Not all people who have been persecuted, it is just because they have been righteous. Um, That is not what I'm saying here, but there are times in life where people are specifically persecuted for their righteousness. And it usually happens by people that are really close to them. Just like Zachariah and Elizabeth, it was their neighbors. It was those waiting outside the house, those who would even be there when the child is born and being circumcised and say, no, you need to name it this. It was the people right there in the room with them. But God hears this suffering and he wants to bring hope. To have a child is a miracle. 
It is taking the breath of life and passing it on to another generation. It's an extremely painful and costly miracle. It requires one to reorganize their entire life so that they can take care of this new child. But when we look at this, God sees this miracle, and he's able to work something in it that's going to bring hope throughout the whole world, not just for these two here. So I want us to think about that. Think about the hope that God brings when he works these small, these simple, yet very, very profound miracles in life. Well, thank you for joining us. Anthony, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap that up? It is, <clears throat> it is pretty amazing how often God works through the family in the Bible. Um, I think virtually any hero can be in some way traced through his family and that sort of thing in the Bible. Uh, you know, there's Joseph, um, Jacob, Israel, uh, and then Abraham was the foundation for the people of God, and it was going to be through his family. Um, Moses, his mother, all those sorts of things. The fact that he was adopted by uh, the royalty of Egypt and that sort of thing. Over and over, the events of family are what are what God is working through in the Bible. I mean, not entirely. It's not every single miracle and work of grace comes through the family, but there are so many yeah. that do come through the family. Yeah, and, and you've got to remember, God... The first ordained institution, the first human institution given to us is family. It's marriage. And it is one that is ordained by God. And it's the only one capable of producing more generations of, of mankind. It's a very profound thing. And the, the kingdom of God, it also is set up like a family. You know, the early church wasn't persecuted for calling each other neighbor or fellow community resident or whatever. No, they were persecuted because they called one another brother and sister because they understood they were family. Well, anyways, thank you for joining us. We hope that you're having a wonderful season of Advent. And with that, God love you and have a blessed day.